Hi, I'm Lou. Are you confused about how to do long-term planning when Forest School is a learner-led ethos? Well, in this video, I'm going to share with you three planning models that hopefully will help you plan in the long term, but still allowing the learners to lead the way. One of my favourite things about Forest School is that no two programmes are ever the same. Even if you're running for a school every year with the same age group, the same class of children, every program will be different because every individual in the group will have a unique set of interests, set of skills, set of prior experience. So no two programs are ever the same. You never know where Forest School will lead you. Because of this and its learner-led ethos, I've heard some misconceptions out there such as Forest school leaders don't need to plan, you know, like you just rock up to the woods and just, you know, let the kids get on with it. Unfortunately, that's not true. Um, although to an untrained eye, it might look like that, but actually a lot of preparation has gone into things beforehand to get to that point where the children feel safe and confident enough to lead their own learning. For me, I find it really useful to have some solid long-term planning as a foundation to build from. So I'm the sort of person I like to do a lot of thinking before the programme starts. And I found that this makes me much more confident and much more able to think in the moment when learners might take things in a direction that I hadn't previously anticipated. Of course, every forest school leader will have their own style and have their own way of doing things and different things will work for different individual leaders. There is no right or wrong way to plan your forest school programme. Um, so in this video, I just want to share with you three long term strategies that I use for my long term planning in case they're useful to you. I'm not saying that these are the only way to long term plan at Forest School. It's important that you find something that works for you. These are just things that I found helpful. So if they work for you, by all means, take them, use them, share them. I wouldn't mind a signpost to my channel if you share them, but you know, feel free to use them, adapt them, make them your own if they work for you. And just again, a reminder, this is for long term forest school planning. Um, if you're more interested in the short term session planning, then do check out my other video, which is about short term planning. I'll put a link in the description box below. So the first long term planning tool for forest school I want to share with you is something that I call the four circles or the mandala of forest school. And I find this a really useful one to start with to kind of brainstorm what I've got to work with before I start with a forest school program. So I've got my little blackboard here in the woods so I can, uh, can write some things up for you as we go. So first of all, we've got the overarching aim to consider. So most forest school programs will have an overarching aim, as in you could think of that as the reason why the learners are coming to forest school. So we know that forest school is very good at building confidence, self-esteem, emotional resilience. And of course, all of that will be true and will be part of the aim of forest school. But it's also possible that there might be other aims, there might be other reasons that groups are coming to you. So for example, maybe it's being used as an intervention or as a nurture group for learners with special educational needs or perhaps kids that need a little bit more support um, in the classroom. So they've been chosen to participate to try to really bring them out of themselves. Um, it could be, I've, I've heard for a school programs that are for people who perhaps don't have much access or experience of outdoor places. Perhaps they haven't got gardens that they can go to or they just don't go outside very much with their families. And so that's the reason that they're coming to forest school. So there could be all sorts of reasons why a group are coming. Um, and I like to think of this overarching aim. This could come from two places. So it could come from the organisation where the group is coming from. So perhaps it's a school or a nursery or a youth group or an alternative provision of some kind. And they're kind of setting the aim. 
um, but it could also come from yourself as a forest school leader. So say you meet the group for the first couple of sessions and you realise that none of them are listening to each other, you know, they're struggling with their communication skills, struggling with their teamwork skills, and you think, oh, actually, that's an area that we could perhaps work on as the programme progresses. So it could be also set by ourselves if we notice particular gaps that are common in, 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 a, in a forest school group. So once we've brainstormed the aims, I see the unique forest school programme as an overlapping of four distinct things. So you've got the space that you use, you've got the time that you've got to be out there, and then you've also got you as a leader, which also would count any other helpers um, that are involved in planning the programme. All oh, those squirrels running after each other, very exciting in the background. Um, leader, and then the other one is the learners, of course, themselves that are coming. And so I see Forest School as kind of sitting here in the middle where all of these four circles overlap. So this here is your unique forest school program that will be unique to you as the leader, the learners. It's usually unique to the space and the time that you've got. So let us unpick each of these four circles. So starting with space. So every forest school site is different. So some forest school leaders might have access to beautiful, pristine, wild woodland, um, whereas other forest school leaders might literally be using the corner of their school playing field um, and needing to bring in extra resources and things. Um, either of which are possible to run forest school, of course, but the different features of your site will perhaps influence how the learners interact with it and and therefore, in terms of long term planning, you can predict to some extent how groups might interact with it. So it can kind of help you in the beginning. Like, for example, if you've got a slope on your site um, and you're working with younger children, you can pretty much guarantee that they'll want to explore that slope and kind of go up and down it and maybe slide down it if it's slippery days and things like that. If you've got water on your site, you can guarantee that that will be a feature that will want to be explored either by wading into it or making rafts or just generally interacting with it. So elements of your site can influence what might happen at forest school. Then thinking about the time that you've got, so this means both the number of weeks of the programme spanning over, um, but also the session time itself. So um, I know that the Forest School Association, for example, recommend as a minimum for forest school, 24 weeks um, over at least a two year period. So that could be internally 12 week blocks one year and then the next year because they recognise that that's how some schools are only able to do it. But they do also recommend a session length of at least two hours. And I would perhaps agree with that, you know, that you need a good couple of hours to get into the flow of forest school. It is quite difficult if you've got less than that to get into that child-led mode of learning and to see the level of focus and the level of depth. Um, but you know, you've got to work with what you've got. If that's not what you've got, or if you have got longer, <laughs> um, then that's going to influence things. I know some forest schools, uh, you know, they run every week for a year and they're able to go out all day, for example. Um, I've worked in some alternative provision forest schools where that's the case. And you know, you can get quite a lot done and quite a level of depth happening in a, in a full day you know you can incorporate cooking lunch outside you can incorporate all sorts of other things so knowing how much time you've got is kind of crucial to your planning as well then you've got you as a leader and that would also count your helpers as well so thinking about the 
style of leadership that you have. Different people have different ways of being, um, and that's totally fine at Forest Hill. That's totally cool. Everyone has their own style. Um, but you also have different skill sets as well that you might know lots and lots about bushcraft for example and therefore you would be better able to support those skills maybe you've got a helper that's really good at craft ideas and arts and expressive stuff and so perhaps their skills would be more ideal at supporting learners if they go in that direction so um, having like a little bit of a skills audit a bit of a reflective practice as a leader thinking about what your style is um, and that can help you with the planning. If you're a new forest school leader or you're in training, I'd recommend kind of sticking to your strengths at the beginning and then slowly building up your repertoire because it's important, I find, with learners that could be doing all sorts of things to sort of stay with what you're confident with um, and build from there. Um, if you end up doing something that you're not so confident with then that can um, lead to disappointment I suppose sometimes <laughs> with learners if, if you haven't quite got enough knowledge or skills to support them in the direction that they want to go in. Um, of course that's not to say that our skills are static of course if you if you have a kid uh, say they're really into birds and they've noticed birds and bird language and stuff like that and you know nothing about it then that's a good cue for you to start developing your CPD or um, you know, one of your helpers might have those skill sets, of course, as well, or be more interested in developing it. Um, so as the children explore and take things down different paths, then we grow and develop as well as individuals and can learn alongside them as well, which is totally cool and a good thing to model to the children. Uh, and then finally, the learners. So they're going to be a unique group of individuals. I know I've been saying children a lot, but forest school doesn't always happen with children. It could be adults as well. It could be families. So it could be any age group. So depending on their age and their background and their previous experience of being outdoors, all of those things are going to influence how they're going to be in the woodland or in the outdoor space. So. Um, sometimes before we start a forest school program we don't really know much about the group you know we haven't met them yet so sometimes having a little chat with whoever the organization is that the group are coming from find out a little bit more about the individuals their prior experience anything that they know that they're interested in can be really helpful at the start of a program um, to help with the long-term planning or at least help you get through the first few sessions to try and kind of best guess what will fit with them um, I found from running Forest School that there are often certain similarities between age groups um, and sort of different client groups but they're no, by no means exactly the same so in the early days I kind of make best guesses about what a group of five-year-olds or what a group of 15-year-olds might be interested in um, and then see how the first couple of sessions go and then go from there um, and observe and change and adapt. Something else just to point out about this model is that you can also see the six principles of Forest School kind of reflected in it, even though I know I've only got four circles rather than six, but they are all there, I promise you. So you've got that Forest School is a long-term process and with many repeated sessions, so that's your time circle. Then you've got Forest School takes place in an outdoor wooded environment or environment with trees so that's your space bubble i would say also the space bubble um, involves the pr principle about risk so there's the forest school principle about that it, forest school encourages and promotes appropriate risk based on the environment and the learners so i would say that space provides provides that as well and so looking at risky opportunities might be something that i do when i look at that bubble um, then you've got the forest school principle about having qualified level three practitioners that are reflective. So that's your leadership bubble there. Um, and then the learners bubble. So forest school is a learner led 
ethos based in play that's one of the principles so that's important to find out about your learners to be able to support them best in being able to lead their own learning um, i would also say that the holistic development um, principle would fit there so forest school supports holistic development of all individuals so when we get going with a forest school program we start observing the needs of our learners um, we will be looking at that from a holistic perspective. So even though I've only got four bubbles, I would say that all six principles are echoed within this mandala. So these are the four circles, or sometimes I call it the mandala or a forest school. And this is something I do right at the start, before I've even met the group, before we've even started going out to give a good kind of brainstorm about what I've got to work with and kind of trying to predict some of the directions that we might go into. And I find this helps me as a starting point for my long-term planning. So once I've got the essentials down with the four circle diagram, I like to then put a bit more flesh on the bones, as it were, and start exploring potential topics that we might explore as the Forest School programme goes on. So the way I do this is through using a tree model, which seems rather appropriate for Forest School. So the best way to explain this is probably actually going through an example one. So we're gonna do an example one here to show you. So I've got the roots of my tree to start off with. So in the roots, you want the information about what you've got to work with. So it's predominantly about the learners. So thinking about that learner bubble that we had with the four circles. So I'm gonna plug in the information I have about my fictional learners. So I'm gonna say they are year twos. So that's what, six, seven year olds, okay? So I'm gonna say six, seven years. And I'm also going to think about what was that overarching aim? You know, why are they coming to forest school? And I'm going to say in this example, maybe we've noticed that they struggle a bit with their communication. So sort of communication, teamwork, that kind of thing is the main aim, as well as obviously all the emotional stuff. Comms, teamwork. And then I'm also, maybe I've asked their class teacher or other people who know them, um, what, what are they interested in? What have they noticed them doing? And maybe they've said, oh yeah, they've been making dens in the corner of the playground at playtime or something. So we know maybe that there's a topic of interest. Um, so we'll say that it's den building. Um, so those are our inputs. Those are our roots to our trees. Then we're gonna come up the trunk and there's kind of two sides to the trunk. So I see the trunk as the resources that I've got to work with. And when I say resources, I mean both external resources uh, like the site itself and features of the site, as well as kit and equipment that I might have. So that would be our external resources. But I also mean internal resources as well or, or people resources so that might be my skill set as a leader um, but it might also be the skill set of my helpers um, or, or certain qualifications we might have or certain passions or interests that we have so we've got the external resources uh, on one side and we've got the internal resources on the other. So for this example, I'm going to brainstorm my external resources and I'm going to say, well, I'm going to think about the usual sort of kit I would have at forest school. So I'm going to say I've got some tops, I've got some ropes. Um, on my site, I know some of the species that are present because I've done my site survey as a forest school leader. So I know that there's uh, conveniently some, some willow and some hazel that grows. So we've got some willow and hazel and that we've got permission to be able to harvest it. Um, I know I've got a variety of tools. 
um, including digging tools, um, things like buckets and spades. Um, I also thinking about this topic, I know that I've got some books perhaps that show different shelter designs or I've looked on a website and printed off some pictures perhaps of some different shelter designs. So maybe I know I've got a, a book about shelters. Um, uh, so that will do perhaps for our external resources. We've probably got more than that. Maybe I've got some clay as well. Let's say we've got some clay. We know our soil types and maybe there's some clay in some area that we know we, we're good to dig out. Then in terms of our internal resources, so that's our people resources. So um, as a forest school leader, we know a few knots. So we've got knot tying knowledge that might come in handy. Um, also, maybe one of our helpers is also a bushcraft instructor, perhaps, so they know a bit about debris dens and that site, sort of den building. So, um, let's say bushcraft quoll, for example. Uh, maybe another one of my helpers, I'm very fortunate with my helpers, another one of my helpers perhaps um, has gone on a course about willow weaving and making willow structures, maybe that, that would be quite handy, so maybe we've got that knowledge. Um, also, as a forest school leader, thinking about that it's to do with communication and teamwork, I also perhaps want to think about what internal resources or external resources I've got around that as well. So um, maybe I, for example, know that storytelling can be quite a good method um, of engaging people in a sort of a non-direct way to encourage communication. So maybe I'm thinking about storytelling as a skill that might be useful with this group. Uh, maybe I'm also thinking about how my language or the language of other adults will help support people communicate. So thinking again about non-judgmental techniques um, such as like non-violent communication, um, which it's often referred to as MVC if you haven't come across that. So it's a way of talking that's non-judgmental. Um, and perhaps also things like knowing some what I call sentence starters where, um, for example, a good one is, I wonder, you know, I wonder where that ant is going whilst it's carrying that, that piece of leaf. <laughs> like, and, and sometimes just saying those in front of children, particularly quieter children. And the important thing is to not expect an answer you know, you're just making a statement, I wonder, um, and then letting that fall and letting that be, I found can, you know, can make quieter children kind of engage more in terms of language. They might reply, they might not, they might just look at the ant, you know, but, you know, things like I wonder statements is probably a technique that I would use with a group that wanted to focus on communication. So, I've done my brainstorming of resources of what I've got. And so we've done the roots, we've done the trunk. So now comes the branches. And so the branches are kind of like a brainstorm about what actual experiences or activities could take place in this forest school program according to this information that we've got. So it's kind of like a big idea brainstorm. So with what I've got and the resources that I've got, I'm thinking probably tarp and line shelters is going to be something that might happen if they're into den building and we've got those resources and we've got those skills that would help them with that. So tarp and line might be one of the branches of our tree. Um, and so from that, there might be not skill, not knowledge might take the fancy of a particular learner. Maybe they get really into their knots because they've been um, uh, you know, doing that in their shelter building. Um, so with that, that might lead to a bridge somewhere else to kind of knots and rope structures 
It might be a bridge to other activities using ro ropes, like rope bridges, rope swings, other ways, big, making big spider webs, big structures, things that involve knots and ropes in all different ways. That could be a bridge for a particular learner to go in that direction. Um, something else that's quite cool about kind of tarp and line um, is it would require some communication and teamwork you know it's quite hard sometimes to tie a rope up high to a tree unless you've got somebody helping you hold it so it's quite a good direction for this overarching aim as well um, as, a, as a topic because it will force people to talk to each other and cooperate in order to achieve the task. Um, that's something we probably in the early stages would need to be aware of because if the individual skills aren't yet up to a point where they could effectively communicate to achieve the task, um, we might need to step in and support that in some way so that they don't fail at those, at those tasks in the early stages. Tarp and line might also, say, say they're um, pulling out the guy lines and stuff of the tarps and they want to anchor it down, maybe they haven't got any pegs. So, you know, there'll be natural progression to make some pegs which would involve tool work. So again, that might lead to another direction for some in terms of learning to use tools safely and maybe they kind of get quite involved with that. Maybe that takes their interest. So it could be a bridge to tool work as well. Um, tarp and line as well as just the actual practicalities of, of doing tarp and line um, there is the design elements you know and, and sort of inquiry based stuff you know what makes an effective shaped tarp which you could easily see if it was actually raining and you can see whether your water runs off effectively or whether it collects and pulls and kind of need to adapt your design if it's not actually raining you can of course improvise with buckets of water and chucking them over tarps and things so you can experiment with the design and um, apparently there is actually a thing out there called tarpology which it's kind of like a cross between shelter building and origami. So there are these different patterns that you can fold your tarp into to make different types of shelter. So if you've got a learner that perhaps is very spatially aware, very spatially interested, maybe they want to experiment with tarpology and making different shapes and different design shelter. So uh, that could lead to some tarpology. Um, so that's kind of like a big major branch exploring tarp and line in terms of dens of course there are other types of dens that we might want to explore so a different kind of main route might be debris dens so these are dens made out of sticks or things lying on the ground they're, they're things that you might see in bushcraft or survival skills the idea with a debris den is that you don't need any tools to do it you can just harvest things from the environment um, and put them together um, and again there are different designs of debris dens so that would link with that and there are different ways of uh, doing it debris dens often use y sticks to kind of lock together and triangulate to give them strength and things um, one thing i would say about debris dens and teamwork is debris dens take an awfully long time to make one if it's a, a, a human sized one so it takes sometimes lots of people to get involved um, it does also rely on a lot of material so that's something to think about in terms of have you got lots of sticks and branches and things to cover the den with um, in your resources on your site um, in fact debris dens can be quite intensive on the environment so that's something to think about as well um, certainly if they're big debris dens so you've got kind of those elements if you haven't got the resources to make large scale human sized debris dens then maybe miniature debris dens might be um, the, the, uh, the order of the day so we make some small debris dens and then that offers up some opportunity perhaps for storytelling and for um, interacting in sort of imaginative ways so maybe you've made your debris den mini dens and that leads on to uh, making stick people or mud monsters or, or some sort of creature that lives in the den for example so we could do some stick people 
Um, and then you've got opportunities around creating stories, using language, talking about what those people might get up to in the woods with their with their with their dens. <laughs> um, there's also the opportunity to explore using the stick person as like a puppet to speak through. So there are kind of lots of therapeutic uses of puppets. So if you have got a quieter child or a, a child that perhaps is um, has gone through a rough time, for example, and they're not confident speakers, sometimes using a puppet, or in this case, it could be a stick person, um, as a medium to express themselves through can be a really useful tool. So we're again helping to meet our overall aim through some of the ideas that are coming out of this tree here. So using the miniature people, stick people, storytelling. And again, that might lead as a bridge to other imaginative games and role play and different ideas, small world play, that kind of thing. So that's going off in that direction. Um, what else have we got? So as we're exploring mini dens, maybe, um, you know, that leads to a discussion about animals and the dens that they make, animal homes and habitats and things. So animal dens. And so you've got habitats, who lives in the woods? Why do they live here? What materials do they use to um, to cover their homes. So again, that's leading off into another direction, potentially if learners show interest in that, in terms of understanding the species and the life cycles of the species that live here. So that could be another bridge, um, you know, and there are lots of different games around, like trying to make nests um, and things like that like uh, you making nests with tweezers to try and pretend to be like a bird's beak and things like that as a game to sort of appreciate how difficult it must be for the birds to make the neat nests weaving in and out with those beaks so there might be all sorts of games and activities that would appeal to children that are uh, interested in that um, and then we did say we had our book, didn't we? Had our, had our book about shelter. So maybe our book about shelter explains how some people, our ancestors or indigenous people, maybe it shows different shelters that humans have lived in, for example. So maybe that would lead into uh, um, areas of inquiry about, well, if we had nothing, if we didn't have the tops and things to make, you know, what materials could we use? We've explored debris dens, but maybe could we use different grasses, for example, to thatch our shelters? Or could we use pieces of bark, like some cultures use big sheets of bark to cover their shelters? Maybe that would lead into sort of a uh, sort of historical or geographical kind of inquiry. Maybe people would get interested in that. And then about other sort of what might be called primitive skills, you know, as well as the dens that they made, how did they cook their food? You know, how did they light their fire if they didn't have matches? So it might then lead into primitive skills. And oh, luckily one of our helpers has got a bushcraft qualification. So perhaps we'd know all about, you know, lighting a fire with a bow drill and other kind of primitive skills, maybe flint napping primitive kind of tools and things like that so it could all lead in that direction um so we should call that indigenous skills um so it could all lead up so i'll stop there of course we could keep going there's more branches that we could be adding but i think you get the idea um so as you can see, you're ending up with like lots of branches, lots of possible pathways for play fundamentally. Now, I'm not saying that in this planning we'll definitely go down each of these paths, pathways because I don't know whether we will or not. Um, but what I find is doing this big brainstorm helps me prepare and helps me uh, think more in the moment when I'm out there with the group and they suddenly decide to show an interest in miniature dens and I've already thought about oh yeah we could make stick people and they could be you know puppets and we could do that and it, it, it means I don't have to think on my feet as much. So now I've got several branches of ideas that I can go down with my planning based on what I observe the learners being interested in. And it might be that certain branches never get 
explored by this particular group because that's just not what they're interested in whereas others might get really explored and 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 added to and i mean i've found that the children themselves will come up with many many more ideas than i would ever be able to kind of come up with from the beginning so you know i add those ideas to the tree so for example say one of the children is really into the story of the three little pigs and maybe they bring that to a forest school session one day and you know then they decide that in their den building they want to try and make the straw house the stick house and the brick house and things so as a forest school leader I want to facilitate that because you know that's brilliant that's come from one of the learners so I know it might mean that I need to expand my uh, external resources maybe I need to go find some some bricks or stone for them um, or maybe I need to develop my skills a bit more maybe we need to learn a bit about cob building for example and we could maybe then make some cob out of the clay and sand that we've got on site perhaps um, and then you know maybe a whole new kind of strand comes up three little pigs which kind of links with the uh, storytelling elements the imaginative elements but you know it's also exploring design and the different materials as well um, and who knows where that will lead so you know that's something that could come from learners but you know I add it to ideas because they're always handy in the future as well uh, you would also notice that I had some points where they we bridged to other things so like the tool work like the ropes and not tying like the storytelling and imaginative stuff like the animals and the habitats like the indigenous skills so I wouldn't just have one of these trees I'd have a forest of trees so I would have one of these which is similar but it would be about tools as an interest and where we could go with that I'd have another one which was about storytelling and imaginative ideas I'd have another one about habitats um, and indigenous skills I'd have another one so um, the trees all link to each other now this might sound like quite a lot of effort to do, to, to do. and um, I suppose in many ways it is um, you know at the beginning of a program but I will say that once you've done them, you've always got them and they grow and you add more ideas to them. And I find that, you know, I've still got ones from years and years ago that I still kind of use some of the ideas on the branches from for different forest school programs. So um, I guess what I say is once you've done the work, then, you know, you've got it forever then. So you can build your forest of, of different ideas and different trees. Um, just one word of caution on this though is um, obviously once you've done beautiful forests of trees of topic trees it, you can sometimes get a bit attached to them so try not to be too attached to them because you still want to be allowing that learner-led ethos so even though I might have had this group one week and they were really into the den building and they were doing their debris dens their little miniature dens and they were making stick people and stuff maybe that was happening last week if we uh, turn up next week and suddenly badgers are the thing because somebody saw a badger and they're really into badgers I've got to be prepared to kind of completely abandon my plans around around the den building which I might have previously thought of building upon um, and just let's go let's go with badgers and you know hopefully I would have a topic tree around animals and habitats and tracking and things like that which I could then go down those branches instead for that particular session so I'm not kind of knocked off my feet by surprise because they're now into badgers I've already got some ideas under my belt that I can draw on so the last model I want to share with you is what I call the forest school timeline um, and this is something that I've noticed that is a common thread through all the different forest school programs I've ever been involved with um, and it's basically acknowledging that the energy of a group will change over time um, so hence why it's a timeline so I'm going to draw up here on the board if you imagine that this is a graph with time this is time along the bottom the time of the program 
Um, there seems to be kind of stages or phases that the group will move through. So if this yellow line is the amount of adult-led involvement, of course, at the beginning, that has to be quite high because you need to make sure the group know how to stay safe, establish boundaries, build trust, give them some ideas. So the adult input, if you like, is quite high. But as time goes on, of course, that will decline. So yellow is the adult input. And then the green, actually, And then the blue <laughs> is the amount of child-led activity. Um, then it kind of goes the opposite way. So you've got the blue line being at the beginning, the amount of child input might be relatively small, but as the weeks go on, then that will increase until the children hopefully are leading much more than the adults. You could also say that this blue line is to do with the children's confidence and how comfortable they feel in the environment. It could also be the amount of trust that they're building between the learners and the leaders. So the blue line is learners and the yellow line is leaders. And so with time moving from left to right, I've noticed that there are different phases, kind of three different phases in a program. Uh, so in the beginning, when leaders tend to be doing perhaps more than the learners in terms of leading the session, there, there seems to be a period of what could be called wildness <laughs> um, or acclimatization is another phrase that I've heard other people use like um, that's, that's what the earth education people use or um, the Joseph Cornell stuff. They talk about acclimatization. When people aren't used to being in a woodland environment, they're kind of a bit all over the place. Some of them might be very scared actually as well if they're not used to being in that space. So there's, um, it's a time of heightened emotions. Um, some children are like, wow, this is amazing. I've got choice, I can do everything. And they kind of flip from one thing to another. And it has this kind of really quite upbeat energy of, whoa, because it takes them a while to realize that they're coming back next week and they can choose to do it. And you know, it takes them a while to calm down basically. So um, I, I like to say like the first phase is sort of wildness or uh, acclimatization. So assuming your forest school program's progressing um, through that, then you get to this point where there's this like handing over of power, where the learners are feeling secure, they've built up trust, they kind of know the routines, they know what to expect, and they've really kind of started coming into their own and blooming. And so as a, a leader, at that point, our role is to sort of hand over the power to them. Um, we're still there of course to facilitate certain things um, but you notice really like an energy shift to curiosity and focus and calm within the group. Um, so this is like the golden time as a leader, as a facilitator, because we're noticing the things that they seem to be curious about and trying to subtly support that through modeling skills or modeling attitudes or bringing in certain resources. So I call this sort of middle period, the period of um, growth or focus, because that's when a lot of the facilitation work is, is happening because people are in that more calm, focused mode. And then towards the latter parts of a forest school programme, where the balance of power has kind of completely shifted, completely reversed. The learners are leading the way all the time and, and the leaders, perhaps we're much more in the background. Um, so you know you're kind of in this zone when learners come bounding up to you and go, I know what I want to do it for a school. I want to make a bug box, blah, 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 blah. I've looked this up on the internet and can we make the, blah, blah, blah. you know, they're, they're really leading where they want to go with things. Um, and hopefully because of the middle period of growth, they're already skilled up to some extent as well so maybe they already know how to use the tools safely they know 
the knots, they know the species that grow there, they've got you know quite a good level of understanding and so they're almost kind of completely independent when they get to that stage. Um, so I kind of call this stage like consolidation and independence. Consolidation and independence. Um, because you know sometimes as a leader you can literally sit down on a log and just watch what's going on and they're all busy they're all focused on their little different projects that they've chosen to do they're safe with the tools they're you know they know the knots you know occasionally they come over and ask for things perhaps or bring you a cup of tea or a marshmallow that's always good um but um you know they're, they're pretty self-sufficient by that stage which is great because that means we've done our job properly you know after all the busyness of the early phases of needing support, needing input, you know, they're there, they're able to do things themselves, um, which is where we kind of want to get to. So the other thing that this yellow line can indicate, the leader's line can indicate, is how relevant we are to the learners. So from a self-esteem perspective, as the program goes on and they hopefully build a more okay level of self-esteem, we want to try and slowly and sensitively withdraw our relevance because after all, if they only have good levels of self-esteem when they're with Lou, it's not actually gonna help serve them in life. Um, so we want to actually plan our, our significance, if you like, to the learners. So this yellow line could also um, represent that as well and it's important to plan that into your program because you know if you're really special to those learners because you've spent time building that relationship and becoming significant and then the program comes to an end and you're not there anymore then you're kind of dropping them from quite a big height um, so planning to, to be less relevant means that when the program comes to an end then they're much better able to handle the transition of, of separation from you. Um, so we've got these three phases, the sort of the wildness, the acclimatisation at the beginning, we've got the growth and the focus where we're doing an awful lot of facilitation work, seeding skills, modelling things, um, and then finally you've got that period of consolidation and independence. A fourth thing to mention out of this is also transference. So transference is happening all the way through the programme. So this is transference of skills and attitudes to the rest of those individuals' lives. So that could be things on a very practical basis like maybe before forest school they didn't really go outside very much and now they're dragging their parents to the park or to, to go to the woods perhaps so it might be something very practical but it also could be something more social and emotional so bearing in mind that those are the focus skills at forest school that we're trying to work with so maybe we've built resilience in a person now of course resilience is applicable wherever you are whether you're in the woods or whether you're at school or whether you're at home you know that's a skill that will travel with you so all through this process although there's this period of change in terms of the energy uh, and competence of a group you've got transference that runs through it um, some people would call this like the ripple effects of forest score how things change things in the rest of a person's life so it's important to mention that I haven't got any fixed time periods for where these three phases kind of change because it really depends on the learners that you're working with. Um, in my experience, like mainstream primary school kind of age groups, um, the, the first stage acclimatisation can take usually between four to eight weeks sometimes depending on the group um, uh, before they then move on and sort of settle into it and we get sort of developed into the the more focused skills um, whereas I've worked with um, sort of uh, looked after children 
teenagers that you know have had some pretty tough times in their life and their period of acclimatization was much much longer because it took them longer to trust me um, it took longer to trust the sites um, and get through some of the tests that they kind of put you through so you know that that actual period of, of wildness or acclimatization took several months um, with that group so there's no set time frame it depends on the needs of the group as to how long each takes but you can see that this is another reason why forest school is a long-term process um, you know if you're only running a, a short-term taster program say of six weeks you're really still in this kind of period of acclimatization and wildness you don't really you might with some individuals but in general the whole group you won't move into that period of growth within six weeks um, so that's why for a school ideally is a year long to get through this whole this whole process so um, I hope that helps you as I say the reason I kind of draw attention to this in terms of long-term planning is kind of recognizing that the energy of a group does change over over the weeks over the months um, and so recognizing what phase a group is in can also help you with planning appropriately so there you have it there are three of my long-term planning strategies or tools that I use for planning my forest school programs. So you've got the four circle mandala, which gives a good kind of starting point and overview. You've got the forest of topic trees to help you explore certain topics and perhaps more details of activities or ideas, experiences that might come out of uh, different pathways. And then there's the forest school timeline that helps you work out kind of what sort of energy vibe the learners might be in at a certain point in the program. So I hope you'll find them useful and give them a try. Do remember if you want a fuller picture of the forest school planning process then do check out my video about the short-term session planning as well which the link's in the description below. Have you got a different method of long-term planning? Do let me know in the comments below. If you've enjoyed this video, do give us a like and subscribe so you can join us in the woods next time. And thanks for watching. Long-term plans can help us prepare so that we're not caught out unawares. Learners may take things where they please, but we've made notes of topics to the trees.